Hello, it's Scott Manley here. I love to talk about space hardware, and this usually means rockets and spaceships, but sometimes there are more mundane, everyday items used in spaceflight. In fact, one of the most significant things brought to space on John Glenn's first orbital flight was something that he bought in a store. This was the camera, which he used to take some of the historic photos of Earth. As I understand it, John Glenn bought the camera on his own because he was concerned that there might be delays in getting something approved for flight if he went through the regular government acquisitions process. I'm not sure why the mission planners hadn't considered a regular camera early in the, in the process. Perhaps they'd left it out because there was a science experiment involving another modified camera on the same flight. Or it's possible that because the early automated flights in the Mercury program had included cameras that took lots of photos of the Earth, that maybe they couldn't see the advantage in having a human holding a camera and pointing it themselves. So yeah, John Glenn's camera. It was uh, an Ansco Autoset 35mm camera, which was actually a rebadged version of the first Minolta Hi-Matic. So this was uh, the first Minolta rangefinder camera with automatic exposure. So it would set both the aperture and the shutter speed using a built-in selenium light meter. And this automation would obviously make it good for use in flight when you know he'd have John would have his suit on and he'd have limited chance to adjust the controls and possibly also be busy with other things. Now to make the camera usable in space, NASA engineers took it and they modified it. They flipped the whole camera upside down and they added a pistol grip with thumb paddles that would actuate the shutter and film winding controls. These connected physically to the controls on the camera. Now, they also needed a viewfinder, so they added that on the top, which of course would now be on the bottom, but that would also be helpful because it could be used with the suit helmet closed. The other camera on the flight was a Leica, which had been modified for a science experiment. It had been given quartz optics and a prism to perform spectroscopy on stars. So the experiment would involve taking photos of stars in the constellation of Orion, and the light from these stars would be dispersed by a prism allowing the spectra to be seen. But because these images were being taken in space, the spectra would stretch into the ultraviolet region, uh, an area of the spectrum which is on the inaccessible to ground-based astronomy. Now, I'm sure there's a lot of you out here, by the way, right now who are making comments about how John Glenn wasn't the first space traveler with a camera. Because, of course, on Vostok 2, German Titov carried a Soviet Convaz movie camera. It had about 300 meters of film. And I hear that during the launch, the exposure setting dial broke. So uh, Titov pretty much had to guess his way through the exposures. But uh, he did a pretty good job. And these are the first images taken by a human in space. Gagarin didn't fly with a camera, so he could only describe what it looked like over uh, you know, radio. Uh, I'd love to talk more about Russian cameras, but I, I don't actually have any sources. So I'm going to focus on the US side of things. And on the US side of things, Wally Shira would be the one to set the future standard for space photography gear when he took a Hasselblad 500C camera on six orbits around the Earth in his Mercury capsule Sigma 7. Apparently, Wally was a bit of a shutterbug, and when he was preparing for his mission, he asked professional photographers who'd been following the Mercury program, uh, you know, advice. And uh, based on their advice, he bought this uh, Hasselblad camera at a Houston photo supply store along with you know, lenses and film magazines. So the Hasselblad was a medium format camera. It exposed a much larger area, four times the area of film, and that meant much higher quality images. The camera also allowed the changing of lenses and you could swap out film types between photos and that would prove to be really useful on later missions. Again, the cameras would be modified for flight into space. They had a waist level viewfinder and that didn't work in the Mercury capsule, so they took that out and just put a viewfinder on the side. Um, the film cartridges would be modified to hold many more uh, frames of film. I think they used 100 frame rolls and they were locked closed so that they couldn't be opened in space, or they couldn't be accidentally opened in space. The surface, of course, was leatherette. They stripped that off and then painted everything black. The engineers went and looked at it and they figured that they could shave off, you know, machine off parts of the casing to reduce the mass. 
So yeah, this camera would fly with Wally, and then it would also fly on Gor with Gordon Cooper on the final Mercury flight. And apparently the camera actually ended up in Gordon Cooper's possession, and it would be later sold at auction for $275,000. But if you are a camera fan that want a replica, there's a guy called uh, Cole Rise who is making Hasselblad replicas for like $5,000. He has an amazing site where he's pretty much documented the whole process and all the stuff you could ever want to know about a lot of these cameras. So anyway, most significantly, this Hasselblad would set the standard for at least the decade to come and further. Hasselblad cameras became the camera used on Gemini and Apollo, uh, they transitioned from simply taking photos out of windows to actually taking photos while on EVA. And yeah, they took photo of Ed White on his spacewalk. At that point, Hasselblad saw this and they realized that NASA were using their cameras and they got in touch with NASA and began to work directly on cameras for the space program. So for the lunar EVA, they developed the 500EL data camera with a silver finish for thermal control, they had a special low distortion lens and they added the Riso plate, which is a sheet of glass with the grid of black reference crosses, which were uh, you know, projected onto the image. So these, of course, were used for extracting measurements from the images off the lunar surface. This was a camera designed for science as well as pretty pictures. So Hasselblad's 70 millimeter format would actually continue to be used after Apollo through Skylab and well into the shuttle era. But rewinding a bit, it was towards the end of the uh, Apollo program that NASA began to introduce the smaller 35mm Nikon SLR cameras. Nikon began working directly with NASA at this time. They would make customized versions of their cameras to NASA standards, and their cameras actually continue to fly in space today. Again, they had to convert these consumer cameras to NASA requirements. The base cameras had the exterior level removed and they were simply painted matte black. NASA stipulated that they had to have special vacuum safe lubricants. They had different soldering standards. Many of the plastic parts were replaced by metal and the film transport mechanism had to handle the thinner polyester film used by NASA. And that meant of course that they could fit many more photos onto a roll of film. And of course, there were many exterior modifications to make the cameras easier to use, you know, larger controls, removal of strap lugs, because having a camera on a strap around your neck doesn't make sense in zero G, and modifications of the viewfinder to make it work uh, through a spacesuit. Now, I don't have time to go into any of the detail on this, but Tim Chapman is a camera collector who owns several NASA Nikons, and he's done a lot of research writing some white papers on the modifications as well as you know, compiling the serial numbers of the NASA hardware. If you want to know any more detail on the NASA Nikons, his site is the place to go. So yeah, the first NASA approved Nikon flown was a modified Nikon F SLR and it was flown on Apollo 15. It was part of an experiment to observe space dust. When the command module was in the shadow of the moon, it, it would be pointed out the window and take a number of photos. Unfortunately, there was an error in the coordinate systems and they ended up pointing the camera at the wrong part of the sky. For Skylab, they continued to use the same Nikon F, but they added a motorized drive to it. It was used to photograph Earth uh, through windows. It was used with filters to study Earth's atmosphere and to check that the corona, the uh, solar telescope was working. By the time the space shuttle program came around, they'd moved on to the Nikon F3, and depending upon mission requirements, they had a small version and a large version. The large version handled 250 exposures, which was <laughs> quite massive. The F3 would also be used on EVAs, so it went outside, it would be covered by thermal blankets to stabilize the temperature. And you can actually see one attached to Bruce McCandless' uh, MMU when he's free flying in space. Of course, the camera that took this image was a 70 millimeter Hasselblad. So the next big step forward would be in 1991 with the flight of the Nikon F4 ESC electronic still camera. This began the transition to digital photography. This camera was built out of a regular F4 SLR body, but with a 1024-1024 8-bit monochrome image sensor in the focal plane. The sensor had actually originally been developed for use on the Hubble Space Telescope. 
So the camera was bulky, it stored images to a hard disk, but it was hugely advantageous to be able to transmit the images to the ground where they would get processed by a Pixar image computer and printed out. And this was especially useful, say if you're on a mission, you've grabbed a satellite from space and you need help from the ground to solve problems. You know, a picture literally is a thousand words. There was a second digital camera flown around the same time. It was uh, developed by Kodak and known as the Hawkeye 2. And while it only flew in a single test flight, it did actually end up being the basis for Kodak's DCS-100, which is arguably the first commercial digital SLR. Both cameras were actually being tested for an interesting payload called Hercules, which would use inertial measurement units attached to the camera to measure the orientation so it could tag images with their longitude and latitude on the ground. The system would take the orbit of the space shuttle and then the astronaut would align the camera with some reference stars and then after that, the system could figure out where the camera was being pointed thanks to the IMU. Now my phone has an IMU in it and it's the size of a tiny microchip, but back then, the IMUs were huge physical gyroscopes. That, and if you look in the photo, it's that big cylinder attached to the bottom of the camera there. So the first commercial digital camera used in space was apparently the DCS-460, which was again a Nikon body with a digital back. And I think the whole thing cost something like $28,000. But for that, you got six megapixels of color imagery at 12 bits per pixel and the ability to take an image every 12 seconds. They could fit 42 images on the 260 megabyte hard drives that would fit into their uh, PC slot. Over time, of course, they'd upgrade. They had the DCS 660, the 760. They got better and cheaper thanks to Moore's Law. And it's also worth noting that these digital cameras were actually still based on the Nikon F-series bodies. So astronauts who used one would be sort of familiar with the other. In fact, sometimes you'll see astronauts refer to the DCS 760 as the digital F5. Which brings me to the last film camera used by NASA in space, the Nikon F5, and it made its debut on Endeavour in 1998. By this point, Nikon had incorporated most of NASA's requirements into their regular production, so the cameras were almost identical to those in stores. These were carried on EVAs and were something of a step up from the F3 since they added autofocus capability. There's a lot of out of focus shots from you know, spacewalks. Nowadays, of course, everything is digital. According to Wikipedia, there's at least 10 types of Nikon digital SLR that have been used on the space station. The current NASA standard, I believe, is the Nikon D5. Uh, but, you know, the advantages of instant feedback are one thing. But even if you want to use film, there's this problem that missions to the space station last month. And... Because of the higher radiation and low Earth orbit, the film fogs up from radiation exposure. And that's a problem that never mattered as much on the space shuttle because it only stayed in orbit for a couple of weeks. Skylab actually had a radiation hardened film vault and that's so that they could protect it. And when Skylab broke up on re-entry, some of the biggest chunks of debris that made it to the surface were the vaults. On the other hand, Cameras on the ISS can get permanent bad pixels from radiation damage, so it's not all good news for being digital in space. But I don't see that as a technical argument for returning to film. Ultimately, as the cost of space travel drops and we start to see some space tours, maybe we'll see some of them deciding to return to film again for artistic reasons. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.